I just had some just some general thoughts and questions, and I thought it was an interesting topic because I'm sure, as you've noticed, it just seems to get more and more, uh, you know, more and more time or subject time on social media and the news and everywhere else, and and it's really uh, it's really fascinating to me people's different perspectives of it. I mean, you mm-hmm. you mentioned using it before. I think before I really saw the sort of the outcry on social media, but. You know, I, I only see the outcry, obviously, from the people that I'm connected to on social media. So I'm a little bit in the writing community and folks like that, a little bit of voiceover artists and, and those sort of folks. So, you know, I see some of the objections from them. And then I see some of the people talking about the positives and different things. And it just got me to thinking about it. And, you know, as you were talking about you know, using AI sort of as a mix and that appealed to you. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thought, too. Mm. So, how, so is that what you're still doing? Are you still doing a mix, or did you just go all in for uh, cloning or AI, or is there a difference between <laughs> cloning and AI? Uh, there is with the is software there? that I'm using, yes, to to a degree. Um, but 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 I, I guess we've started now. But I'll I'll back up a little bit and say that I, I'm always of the belief that a technology is not inherently negative. It's it's how we use it that gives it its negatives and positives. So when people are complaining about something and they only see the negatives, is that because they only see people doing negative things with it? Or in combination, is it because their livelihood is at stake because of it? So therefore it is inherently negative. There's two different degrees of negativity there. And are they they mixing the two together? Yeah, I I think that's, I think that's right. And I have the same sort of thought about technology too. I think that it's not, I don't know that it's inherently evil or inherently good. It's how we use it. But I think AI changes things a little bit. We should probably probably define what we're talking about with AI too, because I, I think there's a difference between the sentient type AI of a like a C-3PO or an R2-D2 or something that can think by itself and appears to have a, I guess a robot soul, if you will, compared to, because because we've been using AI for, I think, quite a while. If you think of it in terms of spell check and Grammarly and those sort of things, I mean, those are helping us out. You know, we don't go back to thesauruses or I still have a thesaurus, but I don't use it. I use the internet. So, you know, um, and isn't that kind of an AI? Would you, would you agree? Um uh- I, I know what you're trying to say, but I, I w- I'd never thought of it as AI, and I wouldn't, <clears throat> in retrospect, think of it as AI either, because it, it's I just think it's clever programming that just finds the errors. But then, but then maybe I'm describing an aspect of AI itself, the modern version of AI. I just thought it was just a rule that some people set up. Uh, if you spelt it wrong, then flag an error, and that's it. It's just a ch- code check, in a sense. Yeah, it could but, be. Uh, I mean, and, and you're probably right. It's probably uh a stretch no, for me right. that that's ai but but it's certainly a, a computer um uh, enhancement that we're using well no, and what well, sorry my, my i'm trying to i'm trying to say that you're correct in what you're saying and how and how you're sort of looking back on those very sort of mundane tools as a very low form of ai because in my story that i'm writing i have to answer this question as to whether this character is alive and he is an artificially generated character but at some point we are kind of reductionist in our view about ai and we say well it's not ai unless it does this or it does that and we keep going we've kept uh moving the goalposts so to speak you know first it's not clever until it plays chess and beats us now it did and then it beats us in something else but when you are looking back at other things and at first i'm trying to dismiss it but then i'm arguing about the you know the the bits and the bytes that build up the sum because ai yeah. now incorporates those things so just as us as babies are we alive as a baby we can't do anything but we no right. question no there's no question we are alive as a baby but yeah. we are entirely useless <laughs> well we, we we can't make a whole lot of choices and of course who could remember what choices you actually did make because they were really made for you you know when right. you ate what you ate um what you drank, you know, those sort of things. So I don't know, you know, I, I, I look at AI and, and I think, you know, one of the, that's a good point that you brought up. A lot of people that are, are afraid of it, I think, are 
I mean, you hear a lot of the doomsday stuff, but I was, you know, the article I wrote for my blog was more about how it's going to impact arts, you know, yes. uh, you know, things like, uh, you know, paintings or whatever it is. And I can remember probably, I don't remember when it happened, but it was probably about a year and a half ago, maybe when the first AI generated book covers had come out and it was sort of an experiment and people were playing with it. And I went to it too. And I punched in, I think my the title of my story or something, and it generated a, a book cover. And it was sort of abstract. It's, it wasn't real crisp and clean. And then you started to see the artwork that really was crisp and clean. And I and I started to think, okay, that was AI generated. So I guess, you know, like mid-journey AI, I've seen some photographs or images from that that are pretty spectacular, I think. Uh, I look at them and I think, wow, that would that would probably have cost me, you know, anywhere from five hundred to a thousand dollars to have an artist actually generate that for me. But they would have generated it probably using Photoshop or some sort of imaging tool like that. And then I started to question: Well, is is AI is it so bad that you know because I'm paying somebody to generate an image? based on my characters or a scene or something like that. And they're going to use some sort of technology to create that image. So what's the difference if I use it and I tell the AI to generate this image and it does that what I've essentially done though, is cut out that artist. And I think to your earlier point, I think that's right. I think people are concerned because it's, it's going to impact their livelihood. You know, if they're graphic artists, AI is going to have a big impact on that. Mm. Um, you know, people were uh, complaining about, for example, you know, in voiceover. And I actually did a bunch of recordings today because I'm, I'm recording my new, my new sci-fi novel. And so, you know, I recorded, you know, about, I don't know, four or five chapters today. And, and as I was recording it, and as I was going through it, I thought, you know, if I used AI, I could probably have this book done inside a day, you know, because I could clone my voice and the book would complete, be completely done. But I'm sitting in this booth. It's relatively hot because uh, I don't have the air hooked up just yet. And and I'm going through it. And it took me a couple of hours. Uh, it takes me maybe about an hour to do a 30 to 45 minute uh, chapter. And so because I make mistakes and all that kind of stuff. And I was. I was thinking about it, but then I realized that as I'm doing it, I don't think AI would read some of the inflections that I, in the same way I would. I just don't think it would. And I don't think we could teach it to do that either. I mean, it could probably, maybe could clone my voice, but I don't know at certain points, for example, I would have to tell it like, wait, this is not, you know, where the inflection should be, or you should be a little bit lower here. And I would have to go through that. So essentially, It'd just be able to be faster for me to do it myself, I think, in some ways. I, if that makes sense. It does. I actually try to clone my own voice with the <clears> software <throat> that I'm using. And you know, when you first begin recording, I mean, everyone does this. When everyone hears the sound of their voice, they say, oh, that's not my voice. And they don't realize that you're listening to your voice outside of the, the way it resonates inside your head because it's here. So, of course, it yeah. sounds different from the outside. And I had that moment again, but... I knew for a fact it wasn't my voice. I'm used to the sound of my voice sounding different. And uh, now I just can't tell the difference, but it would create certain words or it speak certain words. Say, what do we say? Create words, speak words. But anyway, you get my point. It spoke yeah. my own words back to me, but I would never say the word home. And it said it like that. I would just say home, but it said yeah. home. And no matter how much I said, I tried to avoid that sound the AI kept switching it back to that sort of voice. And I knew, right, it, it can't do my voice yet. So I just don't let it do that. That's why I created a brand new narrator voice for my uh, Voyager story. Oh, I see. Yeah, listen to it. I, I, I thought it sounded like Tom Hiddleston. I, I thought I thought you used Loki. Did you use Loki? Because that's what it sounds like to me. Oh, okay. No, I just went through different permutations of British voices. And then oh, okay. just settled on one that I liked. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that's that's all i did um now yeah, a lot of people it, man, so sounds like tom which one did you hear did you hear the animated episode um, on youtube watch the one on, on youtube the, right. the last one you had out yeah the last okay. one you, i don't think you had the whole episode right you just have no just the chapter yeah the first scene yeah. that was it 
yeah. uh, because it's so expensive to do the animation. Oh yeah, yeah. But but yeah, saying that really... the the but the voice work, I guess we're slowly getting into it. The voice work uh, for cloning my voice isn't good, so I recreated. So when you said, "Are you getting AI to do it?" In the Eleven Lab software that I use, they allow you to clone voices or artificially generate one of their voices that they've already made, and the voices that they've made are essentially perfect in terms of you're not being you're not able to distinguish it's a person or not. Some of them are a bit weird because no one speaks like that. Some of them, but I'm talking a very few where you, when you clone a voice, you've got to work at it. You've got to provide a cleaner set of uh, sound files to really try and emulate the voice that they that you want from it. I see. How's the, uh, you know, because I, I was thinking about that too, and I thought, well, one of their voices would be okay, but I still don't know that they would pronounce things the same way that I write them in the story. Uh, I guess you'd have to yes. almost teach the, the AI, AI, AI that. And so, fantasy yeah, authors, for example, which would have, like, I, I, you know, I'm reading a book called, called Hacks Fury by N.J.M. Hemphrey that I, I like a lot. And he's a, a friend and I, I like his work. And Hacks Fury is sort of a take on Batman if he, you know, was a knight in some fantasy, you know, realm and uh, was killing bad guys with a sword and things like that. It's sort of, it's a Batman fanfic is how it started, but it's really interesting. But he has, his words are hard to pronounce because he's got, a lot of different names for towns and people and religions and just everything in there is really created out of his own, his own mind. And and it's even hard for me to pronounce. And I was, you know, I've been trying to work on doing some, uh, you know, narration for him, but it takes me a long time because I stumble on the words. They don't come because it's yeah. not English and it's not real English. So, you know, like Loken Val or something, he has a couple ones that are, they're just hard for me to pronounce. And I got to thinking, AI is probably not going to be able to do that. So at least not without a sample. Uh, yes, yes and no. For example, some things uh, I type into the into their sort of editor that does the text to speech. Let's say the Gem Hadar, uh, an alien species from Deep Space Nine. If I type it exactly how it's written, it it doesn't say the word properly, and you've got to sort of retype it and remember the spelling unique to the software for it to say it uh, so you so need like, to spell it phonetically when you put it in there yes yeah to, to try and get okay. the, the better approximation of it but saying that even though i'm technically misspelling those words it i have not had a problem every every difficulty so if i throw in like a paragraph and it miss and it mispronounces one word then i zoom in on that make a note of it change it and it's fine that for the narrator oh. voice so far I can trust it, say, 95%, but I have to be careful sometimes. So if I throw, you know, like how in Star Trek, the, vet, the Federation ships have registry numbers. Yeah. So the NCC-1701, it wouldn't say it like that. It would say NCC-1701. Oh. <laughs> okay. So then you've so got you to, type to type it. it. Yeah, 1701, not just put the numbers in it. So you, you've got, I've got to do a bit of learning on top of the fact that it's got to learn as well. Uh, wherever they tweak the voices at a later date on their server yeah well and you know it's only going to get better i mean i, right. mean, I wonder mm -hmm. you know i wonder how much ai you know has been used uh of course already before it really became um a topic you know i think it's been out for quite a while and i mean i i know i have a friend of mine that's in healthcare and he actually invented uh software to help detect when somebody's stealing drugs out of a hospital or something like that. And he called it machine learning. He didn't really call it AI, so to speak, because, you know, it doesn't have that artificial intelligence. I think that everybody gets freaked out about, you know, it's not the Terminator machines it's, it, yeah. but it's a computer and he's teaching it what to look for the red flags and those sort of things. And there's all kinds of data points. And he, you know, had to talk to a lot of different people and um, to find out what are some of the, common traits in those kind of activities in order to be able to flag it and point it out. And it's not perfected in any way, but, but that's a little, you know, so I know it's been around for a long time. I know the governments have a lot of different technology they're using private enterprise, those sort of things. But when it comes to the art part of things, we're just starting now, I think to see it, but, you know, and I, and I think about like, I was looking on Fiverr because I go to Fiverr quite a bit for artwork and, 
different things that I need to find folks. And, and I just recently saw a couple of them where they're talking about how they can mimic James Earl Jones's voice, you know, for whatever you want. And I thought, I wonder if that's true or if that's AI. And I suspect, cause there's too many of them. So I suspect it's gotta be AI when somebody's using AI and they've taken his voice, they've cloned it a little bit and they're using it for that purpose. That's what I think anyway. Mm. The, to go back, to go way back on one of your other points when we opened this discussion, when you, when you said that you have friends who are upset about the technology and, and how it can't well, do this and it can't do that. Well, they're not friends, but on okay. social media. So yeah, so yeah, the social media acquaintances that, and mm -hmm. uh, your, the, the writing circles that you're in, they, do you think that when they say it can't do this, do you think they don't realize that this is moving so quickly that whatever that thing is that it cannot do, it will do it next week or next month? Yeah, I, I don't think they're thinking it that way. And, and I don't see it. Um, like I said, I'll read some of the threads and and they'll say that they'll say, oh, they can't it can't do this. And I'm thinking a year ago, that's why I brought up the painting a year ago. I asked AI to generate a book cover for me. And it was abstract. It was OK, but it wasn't what I had in mind today, which isn't that long ago. If I asked if I went to Mid Journey AI and I signed up and did that, I would get exactly what I wanted, probably a crisper version. Mm -hmm. So and I think it's so perfect that you really like I look back at one piece that I had done for myself and I wonder if AI generated it because it's so crisp and it's so nice, you know, and that's the dagger and the rose. And and I'm <clears throat> I don't want to cast a dispersion on the artist that did it for me. I didn't ask him, but, and I don't care if he did, to be honest with you. I think it's, it's nice. It's what I wanted. So I don't have any regrets about that, but I just wonder, cause I think I look at that and I think, and just like you said, next week, whatever they think it can't do, it will be able to do. Cause it just, it just grows exponentially in what it learns and how it does things. Uh, the yeah. only thing that I think on the voice artist part of things is I just know, I just don't think that it's going to narrate the same way that, I, well, I know it's not because it's me. It's me, you know, it's not me versus a machine. It's just the fact that I'm doing it compared to a machine. So it's not going to narrate the same way that I do it. It's not going to pronounce things the same way that I do them, regardless of how advanced it gets. I just don't think that's going to have that. I don't <laughs> think it's ever going to be that capable. Um, I do. But though. I don't. <laughs> Oh, you think it's going to be able to, well, I, I won't let anybody clone my voice and I, okay. and I won't because I am worried about that. I'm worried about somebody being able to take it. Not that they couldn't any already, right? My voice is out there enough. I've already, yeah, you yeah. know, I have enough audio books out there. If they want to take it and clone it, there's probably not a whole lot I can do about it other than maybe hire a lawyer and go through all those, you know, that, that nonsense. But, but I don't, I just, I don't know. I think about some of those words and I don't know if it'll be able to pick it up or not. Um, especially it just was some of the ways I was doing it in there and, and then changing it and doing it a different way and those sort of things to make it sound better. I guess you'll just have to sort of dip your toe in the, to, to, dip your toe in the pool every, every month or so and see, see how it progresses. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, to me, I'm not that worried about it. And I was considering, um, cause I do have a couple of characters in the book. Um, one is an AI car that I have. That the main character drives and which book is this by the way this is bumper city this is my right, new okay. one that i haven't put out yet so <clears throat> i was you know i was thinking about just because it is ai about using ai to generate the voice i just happen to like voice in the character so i don't know that i will switch it or not I, I may leave it the way that it is but i also have a couple of other um you know computer type uh announcements and those sort of things like there's a prison scene and the prison has a riot and there's an announcement that comes over and i thought well that would be a good place for a computer generated voice to do those kind of things so you know it could have a blend kind of like how star trek you know did it with um i don't know how they did it they must have you know just use uh, audio devices to change someone's voice but you know when star trek had the computer talking back to spock and those sort of things yeah. you know and it had that computerized feel and i was considering with bumper city, you know, use an AI for something like those, for those kind of voices. Um, I'm not sure I will though. I, I just haven't made up my mind. Okay. The, uh, the, the mindset possibly that some people have is one that's sort of similar to hardware. If you remember when the iPod first came out, it, it, it had a thousand songs and then 
a couple of years later, it could show photos. And people might have said, yeah, but it can't do video, so I'm not going to buy it until it does video. And then a year and a half later or two years later, then the video iPod came out. And that, that sense of progression is more obvious with hardware because it's something tangible, whereas a lot of the AI stuff is done on the back end and you've just got to keep revisiting it. And I wonder if that's another sort of mistake that people are making, that they try it, say it's not good enough, and then they don't return to it again, or they just, it's, it's through hearsay that they think it's not going to get better or it won't get better. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I mean, I think that, I, I can't remember who it was. It was just recently and he said it was um, someone talking about a, AI and said that the, you know, the, it's not going to be um, AI that is going to leave people behind. It's going to be the people who don't learn how to use AI that'll get mm. left behind. And I, I think that that's probably correct. You know, I think uh, like artists and different folks, you know, they're, they're going to have to learn to use AI. I, mean, I personally think, for example, just editing, you know, and I think as I wrote in, in some of that blog, the article I wrote um, that you read, you know, it's going it, to, I just can't understand how it's not going to make editors obsolete. Because if yeah. AI truly, you know, has artificial intelligence, it can look at uh, a manuscript and fix it in seconds, you know, um, and yeah. then the artist or then the author can go back through and say, okay, this isn't what I meant, or this is what, you know, I don't want to change this way. I can still go back and, and make the edits, but AI is going to make editors obsolete. And, you know, and I, and I think uh, the other interesting thing, and I, I thought about this, you know, I sort of talked about this, but I talked about it more, I think from the publishing side, you know, how many publishers are going to use that for probabilities on profit? You know, you, you you look at something and you say, well, here's an author who's submitting a story or, or they're not even going to have to do that anymore. They're not going to even going to have to take in submissions. They might close off submissions altogether and just send AI out on a search. And as people are putting stories out like myself or other independent authors and say, that's a story because AI could evaluate it and say, that's a story that resonates right now and it could sell with the right marketing and then go back to the publisher and say, here's what I found for you. You know, I found these 100 yeah. possibles, you know, plus they're going to be able to generate more stories faster, especially eBooks. You know, it's not like it's requiring paper or hardware or anything to create a, a physical book. So you could see them creating hundreds, thousands of books for just about anything, which is going to wind up hurting a lot of the independent. It, well, Oh, I think it's probably going to have twofold. It's going to hurt, I think, the bigger ones. Like, you're going to see the, the, I think, the ones who make all the money. Sorry about that. I think it's going to take all the ones that are making all the money, for example, um, like the Stephen Kings or the Rowlings or, you know, some of the really wealthy authors. I think it's going to change the dynamic for them more than it is for, say, an independent. Because an independent now can put their book out with the help of AI, lickety-split. And they could turn around and do audiobooks too and put it out there and have a chance at making it. Whereas, you know, the big names, you know, maybe not so much. Uh, yeah, I do agree. And that's something that I wanted to mention in, uh, because of your article is that you're, you're talking about, you're talking about how, it, how AI is going to influence the top end of say the, the literary world, but also elevate the, the bottom end. And I don't mean that in any sort of pejorative sense. But yeah, I know what you mean. Let's say the, the amateurs and the semi-professionals, it's going to elevate yeah. their abilities. And in the middle, someone's going to get squeezed. And I think, I, think, I think the solution to that is going to be more AI, but in a sense, better search functionality. Because if, if you're able, if the top end is able to just churn out stories all day and the low end have something that's been democratized and then they can churn out more stories, you need something that's going to have to evaluate the, the amount of content that's going to be out there which at the moment, search can't do that. I mean, what is, yeah, I just don't think search can do it yet, but that's something that someone is going to have to work on because of course you want the best stuff from here and the best stuff from there. Yeah, and, and I, I think that indies like myself, for example, if, you know, if AI had really broke like it is now compared to three, you know, three years ago during the pandemic when I started, then my path would probably been a lot different because I, I certainly would have would have used AI to edit my audio, 
There's mm -hmm. no question about it. I would have used it for that because that's what took me the longest. It, you know, it, it, it wasn't too bad narrating it, but what took me the longest was editing that out and making the sound uh, perfect. So, or, or at least good. It wasn't perfect, but at least to where I could get it because I didn't have any skills in it. And so you're going to be able, so people who don't have any skills, for example, well, like me in audio work, it took me a couple of years to kind of figure it out. And I'm still not an audio engineer. It takes me still a little while. I'm much faster now. I can generate, uh, I have a better sound booth and those sort of things. But, and I haven't, have you used any software for audio editing yet? Do you want to know my workflow? <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of curious. Because, actually. Okay. So because you make it, you're, 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 you're we're I mean, I know, I'm jumping around, I know I'm jumping around, but I got a lot of questions, right? Yeah. So we're talking about how AI can save workflows or sorry, shorten workflows and whatnot. And I think back to the days when I used to record my own voice for the Voyager project. Okay. It's such a long time ago now. And I remember getting frustrated and not saying something properly or somebody made somebody outside made a noise and I knew the microphone was sent enough to pick it up. So I had to redo it again, spent hours on it. And this coincides with that podcast I sent you because one of their episodes talks about how AI might make things easier, but it will also uh, add more of a workload. So in my mind, I can get things done faster because I'm making fewer mistakes. But with the audio that I'm generating now, I have to, as I say, it's a piece of audio from online that I'm going to sort of integrate into my story. I have to pull that down. Let's say YouTube Ripper software that rips it from the software, uh, rips it from the website of YouTube. And then I have to go to a, something that I pay for on Patreon, which is like $1 a month, and it separates the audio from the music. So it's a, it's a clever way of untangling that mess. I delete the audio, uh, the music, and then keep the, uh, keep the bit that I want, bring that down. Then I have to boost it because the decibels isn't right. So I'm learning about engineering all the, all the while, I guess, because I'm, I'm using it, I'm learning it specifically for those particular tasks. Then I reintegrate it into my podcast tracks. Then I go back on 11 lab software, and then I have to generate the audio with the text clone the voices as well, which is a whole nother thing. And then somehow reintegrate it again. But, but in my mind, it's faster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me see if, if my mind goes, because maybe you'll, you'll maybe it'll be, it's the same for me. So very similar to what you did. I, I had started out with a blue Yeti mic. I would record my audio. I was in a space where I could hear the outside traffic. So I'd have to wait till a car went by, you know, outside noise. Cause I knew the mic would pick it up. Then I would do the narration. And if I caught it in my head and I knew that I didn't pronounce a word right, or I made a mistake, I'd redo the line and I would do that. And that's why it would take me, you know, about an hour to do 30 minutes worth of work generally. <laughs> and so but what I would have to do is go back and take out all that background noise out of my voice. I, I would take out and take out all the mistakes, which doesn't really take all that long. I cut it out of, out of audacity, then take out any background noise to make the audio crisp and then overlay my um, sound effects and music. So one of the things that I was, I was thinking about just as we broke there for a second was when I hired the voice actors to do, Red Door, and then A Cry in the Moon's Light, book one, as I was editing, you know, in each, each one of them, and there was, there was, I hired three. So I had um, Andrew Oakes, and then I had Sarah Nightingale and Elizabeth Nightingale. And each one of them, each one of their files, their WAV files or their MP3 files had a different volume setting, <laughs> you know, it was, and it was different than, than mine. And so, cause my setup's different. And and they're professional voice actors. They do that to make a living. I'm in, you know, I'm dabbling at this. I'm just doing the best I can. I'm not an audio engineer. I'm, I'm lucky I can, you know, put this stuff together. It's taken me three, three years to kind of learn this. And so, you know, as I was trying to put them together, I kept thinking, how am I going to get these? And what I would do is I would go through and I would do these levels by myself. You know, I would go through Audacity and I would raise, for example, uh, Elizabeth's because she talks in a soft tone and so do I, but Andrew and, and Sarah, uh, they're crisper or louder when they speak into their, and I don't know if it's their mics or settings. I don't have any idea. And so what I would have to do is manually go through and adjust, you know, their speaking to match. So they would all match. 
And it used to frustrate me because I think there's got to be a way you can do this, you know, just put the whole file into something. And it turns out there is. There's a program called the Levelator, which is what an audio uh, engineer that works with me on uh, cleaning these audios up for me, uh, Jamie Kent, he's a great, great guy. And he, he he gave me the program. And of course, all I have to do is take a WAV file and you dump it in there and it levels everything. It makes everything the same sound volume, which is fantastic. You know, it doesn't, it's not perfect, but you know, that's kind I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily think of that as AI, but you know, that's the kind of stuff I envision AI doing. Like I, you know, be able to plug, you know, my audio file into AI and say, okay, AI, um, make all of the volume, make them match, you know, or, but I don't know, I mean, I'm not saying that right, but, you know, make them all the same levels. So it comes out, uh, so you don't have one, it's so soft and the other one's too much, you know, that sort of thing. So I'm kind of excited about that possibility with AI. Okay, uh, something something you might uh, like as well is I want to get a piece of audio. Now I'm doing something naughty. I'm I'm cloning voices from a TV show, and at the moment you can only you can only strip out, as I said before, the music from the from the sound files. So so from the sound effects and and talking, from the vocals, the AI can do that. But what AI can't do, and I want it to do, is separate vocals from vocals. Uh, what do you mean? You mean, uh, so if I have two people talking and I want to clone only one of their voices from those two people, I've got to delete the other voice inside to cl create that clean audio file. So if I, I could, see. if I could strip out the tracks even further from music, vocals, sound effects, and then more vocals, that would be great at the moment. It's just vocals and music. I see. I That's see. what I want. And I, and I was surprised I thought, because I was asking around and they said, you can't do that yet. And I was like, what? AI can't do that yet, but my expectations, no. my expectations are already more than what AI could do. <laughs> well, I think, I think like you said, uh, wait next week, it'll probably be able to do it. I really it, hope so. It, it really just, it, it's amazing. You know, the artwork is, is probably where I saw the biggest or where I see the biggest progression. Um, the people in the writing community were really got upset where there was an artist or an author that I guess generated a book and a publisher picked him up and he used AI to generate the book. And I didn't really read it or go through it too much, but there was a lot of, a lot of gnashing of teeth on that one. Um, people were pretty upset because, you know, how dare this publisher, you know, publish an AI when there's all these independents out there. And then I thought, uh, you know, I, I understand their complaint, you know, I, I do, but that isn't going to stop it because, publishers you know as i said in the article they're they're there to make money they're not there for the beauty of the art i mean you might find somebody that you know yes they do like books and they do want to create beautiful books i'm not saying that you know two things can't exist at once but the bottom line is they're there to make money and the independents the independent publishers even more so because they need to generate they're trying to eke out a living compared to you know penguin or you know any, any of the big well, there's only a couple of big ones left anyway so you know it's going to make things really interesting in that you know you you, you keep talking about image ai and, and image machine learning and i'm not really talking about that because well, what well for two reasons one i have a group of artists who i have to pay anyway for the artwork for my for my story and i don't think the ai is going to give me exactly what i want because it's that artist's style that i prefer but at the same time when people complain as such like you've said these uh, people have done over this guy who generated artwork do you think a hundred years ago there was a photographer that said hey that guy using a 35 millimeter camera he didn't really generate a, a decent photograph he should have used a wet plate collodion like i did that's not fair why isn't my image in the newspaper I to do. Me, I, to me, yeah, that's yeah. what it, that's what it sounds like. And yeah, that, that that's what it is. I keep I keep talking about images just because that's where I noticed the biggest difference. Oh, okay. I don't, you know, I, I didn't read like the author's story or or any of that kind of thing to understand. You know how well the AI generated uh, a book and then was sold. I just just visually, you know, and the one that always comes to mind is Mid Journey AI, uh, yes. which is one that produces some. I think just some fabulous horror type 
imagery. You know, I, I look at some of that and I think, um, man, if I could just figure out how to use that and prompt it, I could get the exact image of the Witch King that I want, you know, and and like I said, I'm not complaining about what uh, Johnny Haxby did or um, or the other artists that generated a different version because they both had their own versions of it. And they had to do that based on what I told them, you know, they had to interpret what I was, you know, my descriptions and whatever came into their mind and, mm. and AI, you know, you're going to be able to do that in a blink of an eye. Cause I could use prompts and say, okay, no, I don't want this or I don't want that. And, and generate something that's going to look really crisp as if it, you know, I don't know, it was maybe a computer generated graphic or something, but, you know, and speaking of, and I know it's not really AI, but kind of is, um, you know, I, I have a friend of mine, we talk about Marvel movies all the time, and he complains about CGI. You know, he does, he's uh, about my age, a little bit older than me, and he complains about, you know, the overuse of CGI in storytelling as opposed to re relying on good storytelling. And he always uses the example of, for example, Casablanca, good story, um, didn't have a lot of special effects, didn't have a lot of action sequences to it, but it was the story that compelled you. And, you know, he complains about it. he doesn't like, you know, when uh, Hollywood uses too much AI and, or too much CGI. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. But like I told him, I said, well, how else would you do it in Marvel? You know, I grew up on comic books. I mean, you you certainly couldn't, you know, show the I mean, I mean nobody humans can't fly. So, you know, if you want to have the Marvel characters, you need to have CGI be able to do that. And so in some ways, I think AI sort of follows that traje trajectory too. You know, there's hey, things well, that... What's wrong, sorry, what's wrong with hanging the guy on some string on a studio, Alan? What's wrong with that? <laughs> oh, nothing, I guess you can we used do, to do that. It last, you we used to do it 50 years ago. The good, right, too good, right. to, too good enough yeah. for you now, is it? Oh, go ahead, go on. <laughs> or, or Godzilla, you know, why can't you put a guy in a rubber suit right. and have him stomp over, you know, plastic buildings as, as if it's real? <laughs> so yeah, I, I do get that. It's, it's the same kind of thing, I think. But um, it's just fascinating to me, you know, how uh, advanced it's coming so so fast. And, you know, I was thinking, thinking about this for some reason, the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek, because I grew up on both. So, you know, I was 10 years old when Star Wars came out, but I was a Star Trek fan before that when I was littler. And, you know, Star Trek was in, you know, 1966, and that's when I was born. So, you know, I, I caught it in syndication. And... I always loved it, but I, you know, and I, I always thought to myself that, you know, Star Trek, I think, has had the bigger technological um, influence on us than Star Wars. Yeah. Star sure. Wars has some. Well, it's the lightsabers, Trek, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and, you know, it's more of a, you know, kind of a, I don't know, a, I always thought it was more grittier, you know, uh, as opposed to Star Trek, which had a, a more crisper, cleaner feel look to it. But, you know, you think about, like, I grew up before there was such a thing as a cell phone. I can remember mm -hmm. pay phones. You know, I can remember party lines that my, you know, my great aunt had a party line. And I can remember, you know, those kind of things. And, you know, there was no such thing as a cell phone. And watching Captain Kirk use that communicator to talk to the Enterprise or to talk, you know, somewhere else without a string was amazing. But yet here we are with cell phones, which are essentially the same thing. You know, they're, they're the exact same thing. And so, you know, when we think about computers, there was AI back then because they had the computer could think and process things, but not quite in the same way as like Star Wars. You know, Star Wars, their their robots could think, you know, for themselves, you know, and seem to have a, you know, their own autonomy, you know, their own self-awareness compared to Star Trek didn't seem to have that too much, except for a few episodes with, you know, and they all were, they were always kind of. Um, villains, you know, like V'ger, you know, those sort of things. Yeah. But, um, but I just thought that was, you know, it's kind of interesting. And you think about how far we've come in a very short period of time, and AI is just going to make that even, even bigger. Mm. If, staying on Star Trek, when again, just like you, I grew up and they were using essentially iPads, and now we have the iPads, so we practically have everything from star trek now except for obviously force fields warp drive um phases teleportation teleportation and yeah. yet we have lasers and, though we just don't yeah. have phase 
you know, we, yeah. we, we don't have as the weapons, you know, like, well, we do have the weapons. We do have weapons that are lasers, but not in the same way as Star Trek. Yeah, they're, they're mounted on warships. They're, they're at that scale. They haven't managed to yeah. miniaturize them yet. Um, but at the same time, Star Trek uh, is becoming, is the word achronistic, where it, it looks older? Is it, is, am I using the word properly? Basically, we have AI now, but Star Trek doesn't have AI. So it looks achronistic when we watch it and that's supposed to be a vision of the future. Am I using that word correctly? Yeah. I mean, eventually, well, if you think about a lot of our sci-fi movies, you know, they eventually our, our actual sci-fi overtook them. And in some yes. cases, yes. you know, became better, you know, so, um, you know, like, what's another good example? Um, well, Star Trek's a good one because, there are a lot of things that we have in Star Trek. You know, you look back on it and go, yeah, we we sort of surpassed that. You know, we have, you know, some AI, but, you know, it's just going to get more and more advanced. And they don't, they didn't, you know, they had AI because they had a couple of, ro you know, robotic type entities that were computers. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you remember the, you know, especially the first movie, the Star Trek, the movie, you know, V'ger was, came from an advanced civilization of robots, you know, mm -hmm. that never really went too far down that rabbit hole as to where it came from but but that's essentially what it was and then there was um there was the episode where kirk uh was the creator and i can't remember the name of the the robot and that you know where oh yes the m5 was it the m5 yeah i can't remember it was um, he was, he was my... a relative of the original uh creator well, of that, it, robot. Really yeah it, it got confused the computer banks were damaged and it believed that that Kirk was the creator when oh, it was another. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know? um, and so they did have a little bit of it, but not, not to the level of which we've come now. And there's, there's a lot of movies that are like, you think about 2001, a space odyssey, you know, um, how, you know, that was of course AI, but you know, we've advanced in our, I think in our, not in the same way, we can't go as far, but just in some of the technology that's there looks old. You know, in, yes, we flipped over it. There's so. a there's a cute there's a cute anecdote that I remember about Star Trek Voyager where they got the laptops, the desktop computers from TNG, and they didn't realize that the pace in which just laptop technology was getting better, that the machines would get thinner and lighter, and so those laptops, even 20 years ago, that they have on their desks, are already out of date compared to the development that we've made. With our own technology never mind never mind even talking about ai but you can't expect a tv show to predict everything of course no and you think about how far some of them tried to go into the future and it caught up really quick you know like space right. 1999 oh I mean, we didn't I, I, really I achieve that, that. <laughs> you know we, we didn't really achieve that yet but um you know folks that just thought things were going to be um i think a lot faster and they didn't quite get there and they mm. quite get there. Going back on your discussion about images, uh, I think something like that would work awesomely well for you because you are not, you're creating something original. So you could play with Mid Journey all day and get anything you want, anything that you need out of it quite easily. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, and I've thought about it. I mean, I do like using the artists um, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, I like giving them the work. You know, if they, you know, they're making a living and, and that's how they're doing it. And I appreciate their interpretation of, you know, what I give them to work with. And so I do enjoy that. Um, I, you know, I'm not saying I'll, I'll never use AI or I won't, you know, wouldn't go to it for that. But, you know, it's it's very tempting. But I do like giving, I do like giving them the work. You know, they're, they're artists, they're independent, they're indies. And so for me, I you know, I just haven't made that jump yet. And I don't know that I'm going to just yet. I, I'm still of the mind of, you know, giving these folks a, you know, that. Now, I think where it's going to be interesting is when I hire somebody to do some artwork for me and I get kicked back and I know it's AI, you know, oh. because how many of those are doing that, right? Like I, yeah, I have an image, cool, like I said about the, you know, about the dagger and about the rose that I hired. You know, and I just get this sneaky suspicion that somebody probably used AI to create those. You know, and well, then I look at if they give you what you want, you'd be happy, right? No. Yeah, I'm not complaining about it, but that's not what I sought out. You know, I mean, I, I sought out an artist, and I assumed that they were going to use some sort of computer, uh, 
aided graphics to help them create the image that I did, which yeah, essentially that's AI, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you're using a computer to generate an image, we call it CGI or, or it's AI, you know, the, you know, you're just telling it what to do and it's putting it together for you. So uh, I don't know, but yeah, I I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm not going to hire somebody to do that when I can do that myself. That True. that's a difference that I, that I would say for me. But if you did hire somebody and you were under the assumption that they weren't using AI and then they produced something that was say created in a day instead of a week, would you not feel a bit shortchanged if you found out later that they used AI and you've paid oh, them, I would. you've compensated yeah. them for a human's effort, not an AI's effort? Yeah, I absolutely would. I would, I would feel, I would, I would be upset about that because so, so to I'm you, okay as long as I know up front. Okay. You know, but, I'm gonna, you, if an artist said, I'm going to use AI to generate this image for you, then, okay, I, then, then I have the choice then to say yes or no, right? True. But then would you, would you expect to pay them less, even though the output, the, the finished product is the same? Would you want to pay them less? Do you think there's a tiered pricing structure with this? That then you've got to figure out if they did use AI or not after you've compensated them for the higher price if it was for a human, assuming you're going to charge a lower price. So ask for a lower price for someone who's using AI and they're a human. Yeah, I, I do. I actually think there should be a lesser price um, because to me, I could use the AI then. Right. Because then I could learn to use the prompts. And so I'm not going to pay, I, I would not be willing to pay somebody to use AI for me. Whereas, you know, cause, cause I don't think, cause to me, the skill level is less compared to an artist. You know, if I, if I contract an artist like Johnny Haxby, who did a lot of the sketches for me and, you know, I look at what he produced, he, he had to take time and effort to produce those sketches and he had to learn how to, to be an artist and, and went to school for it or however he did it. And, I appreciate that effort. And so I'm willing to pay him more than is it, than is if he used AI. Right. And just because I, just because I think AI is just one of those things that I could do myself. So why, you know, I can type in, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm looking for a witch King who's going to wear black and a long coat and uh, knee high boots and a sword and those sort of things. I can put those prompts in there and get AI to do that for me. And so I don't think that the skill level is the same as someone who's an actual artist, at least not to me anyway. But if you just, just continue with being devil's advocate, what happens if it takes you three or four hours to get a prompt like that produces a good result, whereas you could have spent those four hours on the other aspects of your project? Is that not worth paying that person for the AI? It could use be. Of the AI? Yeah, it could be. I think it would depend on how long you know, it takes to get that back. And yeah, if it takes me a lot longer then that's essentially why we, you, know, you pay someone else to help you with a project because you can't do everything all yourself. So, you know, I think that if you get AI involved and it, and it shortens that or it does it for you, that that's worth something. The question of course is how much is it worth? Is it worth as much as a human artist that would, you know, maybe get back to me in a week, uh, seven days, or, you know, someone who can get back to me in seven hours and say, here's your image. Mm. And I'm so just, to me, I think it's less. I'm just thinking as well with regards to tech to text to speech, maybe, maybe I don't want to spend time and I find it, I find it fun to do anyway. So I'm happy to do it. And I have a bit of OCD. So it's very hard for me to delegate uh, on this project that I'm doing. But I wonder if at some point, either one of us would pay someone to do the voices for us. We understand how the, we are, like I say, we understand how to prompt it. We just give the, the other person that we're paying, we're handing it off to the text and say, right, this is the voice you figure it out. Please, please generate it. And then send me back the, the wave file. Yeah. I think that, uh, well, I, I think that's going to happen. Right. I mean, I, I think a lot of independent authors are going to do that. You know, especially if they get tickled with the idea of an audiobook, they're they're definitely going to do that. Myself, though, I'm, I'm probably not going to do that because I do like audio. I do like narrating them myself. You know, where I would like the assistance from AI is, like I said, in the editing process, into making the taking out the background noises, taking out the mouth noises, 
you know, uh, if I could pay AI, you know, I would pay AI to take out the mouth noises for me. Cause that's something I do not enjoy doing is going through Adobe and searching for those, you know, first it was kind of fun and I'm, I'm, I'm much faster at it. I can do it pretty quick. And I've tried to, you know, learn when I do uh, voiceovers or narrations, and I have a lot of water in there and, and I'm always making sure I'm hydrated because that's when my mouth gets sticky yeah. with like everybody else. I understand so, that bit. You know, I'm always taking that, you know, a drink. It seems like I go through three or four bottles of water when I'm in the booth, but. I don't miss uh, those days anymore, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I actually don't mind that so much because I do like doing the narration myself and, you mm. know, I get to think about how I want it to sound and, you know, and how I. I want the character that I'm voicing at that moment to sound, um, you know, with, with Bumper City, that's the one I'm working on now. And I don't think I'm going to hire any voice actors. I, I'm i doing all the characters myself, including the female characters, just because, you know, I got the biggest response out of the podcast. And I did that all myself. You know, that, you know, I even did the female voices and I just made them, I just changed the pitch a little wee bit you know i didn't try and go all falsetto or anything like that but just enough that people would, would know it, you know it was a female character and so i just did that with bumper sitting i'm probably just going to stay with that see how it goes and then because i guess the the beauty for me is i already had the raw i mean i already have it edited and have all the you know, mistakes taken out so if i if i want to go back and re-release it with um voice actors i can do that I can do that later. It's not right. like I'd have to start all over again. So that wouldn't be so bad. I would um, be interested to hear your voice with a high pitched because you've got such well, a good voice for narration. It's, it's not high pitched. It's just, it's just, <laughs> no, just but if a you did, little bit. If you just, did, I'd, I'd I don't like think I hear. could. I don't think I could. I did wind up voicing a lot. You know, I do have a lot more characters in uh, in Bumper City. There's there's a lot more than, okay. uh, than I had <laughs> in Rye. And there's a lot more in The Undead Wars, too. Um, it's a, it's a little bit more in depth compared to red door and, and cry. So it's a little bit more challenging in the booth, but, um, still kind of fun. You said you, you mentioned, uh, Fiverr earlier. Yeah. And for me, I was just about to start getting into it. I, I had actually contacted some artists to do some voice work and one lady flaked on me. And if you want to talk about saving time, AI doesn't flake on me. It just does what I tell it to do. But huh. she, she, she backed out. She said she had an illness. You know how people develop an illness somehow, and then they just magically never contact you. you you've huh. got to sort of contact them. And I wonder if Fiverr has been decimated uh, already by by these improvements that we've already been discussing. But at the same time, to go back onto the idea of prompts. Could there be a, another market where instead of hiring a voice actor, because those Joe's jobs are essentially all but dead, unless you're Chris Pratt and you need to do the next Super Mario movie. Could there be another industry of people who you pay that will prompt you? You ask them, listen, I need I need this for audio. I need this for imagery and I need this for uh, a YouTube thumbnail or something. Even though you can do it with AI, you still want a human touch, some kind of uh, emotive passion, maybe, though that could be an that could be contradiction of terms because you're asking them to do work that involves ai and it's not really their work you know you, you, it's it's subcontracted so they're less passionate about what about it than you are so if you talk about passion you should be doing it but that aside i wonder if that opens up as a job market where i don't have to pay a subscription for this service this service and this service to get what i want and the time to use it and i just offload it onto somebody else and all i have to do is just put it together well, it could, but the, you know, Fiverr is, and the reason that I like it is because it protects the artist as well as the client, because it takes the money and holds it. And it doesn't get released until you get what you want. So that's the benefit of Fiverr. Yeah, but I don't have right? that issue with I could Because I can find any, I could find voice artists somewhere else and I could essentially maybe pay them or pay them half and have a contract and do all that. But then they could back out or, you know, midway or anything could happen and they may not be willing to refund my money. And I would have to, you know, try some legal sort of uh, recourse. But, you know, when I'm in the, you know, the United States and I'm hiring somebody from, you know, South America or Japan, uh, I'm not going to do that for a couple hundred dollars, you know. So, sure. you know, so that's the benefit of Fiverr. Is, is I wasn't able to do all the 
these things. I wasn't thinking of it in that in that manner, though. I I just mean the the effort of contacting all those people, setting it up before they even produce anything takes time, and oh yeah, the AI will just you just you just type it into the text box and and you're good to go, and so you've cut down on all that sort of uh, negotiating negotiating at the beginning. That's that's what I'm getting at, and then the fact that because the AI is consistent and it's cheaper to use. I mean, the amount of money I've spent on voice software for this for the new voice voiceover software is so it's like a fraction of the price of what I was going to ask this woman to do. Oh and, yeah, yeah no question. That's 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 the big difference. But at the same time, yeah. if we talk about how AI again from that podcast you might have listened to, the, there was an episode about yes they save time, but then they enable you to do more things shouldn't we get shouldn't we be worried or concerned or just self-aware of eventually just doing all the work ourselves but it but it just slows us down because we're doing all the work ourselves instead of offloading it with with you know contracts to get someone to do the voice someone to do the artwork yeah am i am i am i am i'm not sure okay okay well essentially it sounds like you're talking about a producer you know whereas instead of you know like myself i'm the producer Mm -hmm. So I have to go find the artist to do, you know, uh, the book cover. And I have to find, you know, the actors, the voice actors to voice the uh, right. characters that I want. And I have to find a narrator voice. And then I have to, you know, find maybe a piece of music or I have to find a particular piece of music that I want. And so AI, is there, you know, is essentially, am I going to be able to hire somebody and say, these are the elements, these are what I want. And that person then goes out and uses AI to get all them together. Is that what you mean? And then they're going to be able to produce it within a very short, or or just one AI. They're to be essentially able to hunt all that stuff down for you too. My point is that they're essentially going to get give you the the audio files, the image files, and then you haven't had to do anything. You can concentrate on writing, and once you've got those files, you can then uh, deliver them however you want instead of sourcing the audio making the audio yourself or trying to use mid journey yourself you could just hire someone to do it for you so in a sense you're just subcontracting it's the sort of the, the what could become the new mundane aspects to a project the least yeah, creative could. parts to of it right it, it could i think that's what i was thinking about uh i think we're talking about the same thing that's how i was thinking about with publishers oh okay publishers aren't going to be able they're not going to need to hire an editor anymore they're, you know, or editors, you know, they're going to be able to hire one person to handle the editing aspect, but that person's going to use AI to do it. So you right. don't even have to have somebody that has any background in editing. All you have to do is somebody that knows how to use AI and say, okay, go get this done. And then that same person, because it's not going to take hardly anything to do that, can also go get an effective uh, book cover done. And so use AI and create a book cover, you know, and create titling and, mm-hmm. um, do everything that needs to be done. And AI is going to be able to know, for example, uh, you know, here's the account, you know, here's our account information and, you know, purchase the ISBN numbers and, you know, put it, make sure it's on NetGalley and make sure it's on, um, you know, Amazon and, you know, all those kind of things that AI is going to be able to put together for somebody, which is going to eliminate all of that extra time and effort in assembling all that. Because you're absolutely right. You know, if I could go to AI, if I had an AI that could do all that for me, and I, you know, and as much as I love Sal, who, you know, does, you know, all my editing for me and the editing company I use, that's the biggest expense. And if I could have AI do it, then I could produce stories lickety split without using AI in the, in the creative process at all. You know, that that's going to eliminate a lot of that. So and I would be willing to do that. I would be willing to look at that. Like I have the Undead Wars, for example, and it's 26 chapters, about 105,000 words. And I am probably going to do it as an audiobook first because it's about a fifth of the cost for me to produce an audiobook than it is for me to produce a written book. Now, the drawback is that Audible will not put it, it will not take it they will not accept it as an audiobook unless it has at least an ebook so you have to have that which 
I think at this point, I don't know that I care that much. I, I'm probably going to produce it as an audio book and let everybody else have it. And if Audible doesn't want want it because there's no ebook, because I, I don't know that I can afford to put the money into the um, the editing process for an actual book. So you know, for a paperback. So I don't know that I'm going to release it. I, I might, but I don't think I don't know that I'm going to do that. Bumper City, on the other hand, mm, I kind of want to do both, but I'm definitely recording everything so that I can decide. And I may not be able to afford to publish that as a paperback too. But if I had AI and AI could produce it at, you know, a fraction of the cost of the editing, you know, going through and making sure that everything looks the way it's supposed to, that I'm not even necessarily talking about, um, I'm thinking more in the terms of just finding every little mistake and um, grammar and double words and those sort of things um, that AI is going to be able to do, but not necessarily change, you know, or have any th any creative input, but just those kind of things, and then put it into the specs and do the layout, you know, because you know publishers that you know they have layout folks, they have um, editors who do copy line content editing, uh, they have the uh, folks that are doing the the book covers, and then they've got to put it all together and then get that through, uh, get an ISBN N number somewhere, and then put it out into the publishing world and send it everywhere. AI is going to be able to do that in a blink of an eye and a fraction of a cost, I would imagine. You know, yeah. but eventually, I think that's going to go up. I, I think what's going to happen is, um, you know, because right now most of the AI, AI I've looked at doesn't look like it's terribly expensive. Looks like it's pretty cheap. And I just can't imagine that continues. I think it's going to start going up because people are going to want to make money off it. Mm -hmm. Well, ChatGPT was free. Now it's now it costs if you really want the good stuff. Yeah, and, and that's what's going to happen. So you're going to see the rise in AI, but it is going to eliminate a lot of those jobs. Ooh. Editors are going to become. I just don't see how they're there anymore. Um, publishing yeah. house. That that was that was my that was the point I was haphazardly trying to get to in the sense that. You, you mentioned before that the producers at the top won't need certain things. And I was looking at it from, from the likes of us. And there's, there's millions of us who are trying to self-publish who at the same time, because they're enabled by this technology can just offload, offload some of that workload onto a new tertiary market that could give it, give it to us. And I was just thinking that, that I was, I was trying to get to the point where the market's going to have to change where, if, if the, like I'm not going to hire a voice actor anymore. I don't. I don't need to. But if doing the text to speech part was getting so laborious at some point, you know, because these things become relative, don't they, in the workflow? And then you think, oh, I wish I wasn't doing that now. I wonder if on a on a large scale that just gets offloaded, and whoever was doing voice work will now do prompt work. So we go sideways with the job market. Yeah, uh, that's probably, I think, I don't know if that's going to go totally that way, but I could not. see a lot of folks shifting, you know, because they're going to have to adapt. Um, mm. They're not going to be able to charge because you're absolutely right. Um, and like I said, I don't want the voice actors that I hired to think that, uh, you know, they didn't overcharge me in any way or anything like that. I was completely happy with what they did and they were very reasonable, but it still did cost money. And yeah. AI is going to do it at a fraction of the cost. And if you're somebody who can't afford, you know, to hire voice actors, but you think your project's going to sound better with different voices, then AI is going to be the way to go. And so the voice actors that want to stay in it, what I'm, what I would think is they're probably going to clone their own voices and then be able to do it faster and do more projects yeah. and not charge as much. I mean, that's a way to, to think of it too. You know, you could clone your own voice so that all you have to do is type it in, but then, you know, you can work on more projects because it doesn't take you very long because all you're really doing is, you know, sort of text to speech kind of thing. You know, someone sends you a script and you have your own voice kind of read it and through the AI and then you send it back and you're not going to be able to charge as much as you would as if you sat in that room in that hot booth and did it, but yeah. you'll be able to work on 10 times as many projects. And so essentially you're, like you said, you're sort of a prompt machine you're not really actually doing the work mm. okay uh do you want to come back have you got more to ask more to talk about no i mean if you know you're probably ready to go no know, no I'm, you, i mean i'm fine i'm technically i'm ahead of schedule 
I've got, uh, I mean, I've got a few more anecdotes to share, um, which I'm well, happy to do. If you want to come back and do another half hour or something, we can. If you got more you want to talk about, I'm okay. I'm good either way. Yeah, I'm just worried that I wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to talk about this guy who was doing podcast podcast descriptions, but I don't think it's enough. He's he's effectively just lost his job because he was doing the descriptions, and now the AI can do it. Hmm. And I I don't know how much you know about people who are actually losing their jobs right now because of it. No, I, I don't really. But, I mean, I, I, other than just just some of the independent artists that are scared, you know, that are like the voice yeah. actors and even the writers, you know, they're just thinking that AI is going to write creative stories and humans are going to be obsolete for for that. Yeah. And even then like, you got the people that are blending, you know, they they're giving their, their ideas to AI and then AI is crafting the story as opposed, you know, so they're a part of the creative process, but they're not actually writing it. And so, you know, I guess that's a kind of a concern too. Do you know much about the, the writer's guild strike? Not really. Okay. Other, other than, you know, they weren't being, you know, the only thing that I've seen is I know the writers uh, have been talking about this for a while, but how they're just drastically underpaid compared to the celebrities and the, you know, the big yeah. producers and things like that. So, you know, and, and I just always felt that, you know, that was, you know, there, there isn't, there is definitely not equitable, equitable sharing in the profits when it comes to those folks, you know, the writers who actually create the stories, you know, the celebrities bring it to life, so to speak with the directors and the producers. But, you know, I, so that's about as much as I know about that. And then they're right. just asking for more wages, but I, I don't know. Are they asking for any any assurances regarding AI? Yeah, they don't want AI to be part of the process, but the studios want it to be part of the process. Well, of course they do. Yeah, because <laughs> as as you and I talked, it's going to be about a fraction of the cost. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So they they absolutely want that. You know. Actually, I do. I do. I, want, I do want to rant about it. So I'll, I'll, I, there is something there for me to talk about, and I'll get your view on it. Let's come back then. Okay. See you in a minute. Send me another link. Okay. Yep. Do you hear me okay? Hello. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. So the the writer's strike uh, is is kind of interesting in a sense that it's it's very timely with their with their protestations and justifiable protestations with uh, the studios who who are already like yeah we just want to outright sort of make you obsolete uh, just for the just for the I guess just because they're greedy for the most part. And maybe, maybe, but then that's very cynical. But maybe they just do want to streamline workflows. But um, I did see a breakdown of how much writers are asking for, and somebody said we only want one. We only want like one percent from the one percent like, of profits. So what they're asking for is is really minimal, and that's effectively what the studio is trying to remove in terms of costs. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be more than that though in terms of calculations, but. I felt recently during the strike, and I've seen a few of them, uh, a lot of bad writers are in the union and they are protected by the union. I have nothing against unions themselves because the UK is more, has a larger sort of so social, I don't want to say socialist, but we have more social welfare programs and the, we, we, we kind of look after ourselves. We don't have that stigma attached to unions like Americans do. Um, would you agree? Would you agree with that before we move forward? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Okay. I'm not up on what you know the UK has in those sort of terms. I mean, I grew up in a union family. My father was a coal miner. And oh yeah, so, both, yeah. Yeah, and then my great grandfather was a coal miner. Came from the Ukraine, and so you know they fought for you know safety and um, food. And you know, you, if you looked at my website, you might have seen a story I'm working on called Coal and Iron. That's about the coal and iron police. And has to do with how, you know, they, they essentially created welfare capitalism, where what they do is, you know, they provide the housing for you, they provide the food, then they provide uh, the church, and they provide the playground and all those kinds of things. And you're trapped, you can't kind of get out of that, because you're not making enough of a wage to do it. And they try and make you happy uh, in their system. And, you know, labor is the biggest expense in most businesses. So, so I'm more on the side, and I do understand 
and you know the idea that yeah you do have a lot of bad writers you have a lot of bad folks in unions uh that mm -hmm. exist there but the idea is to protect those folks and you know if they band together they can usually do better so you so you sort of have to take the good with the bad you know you have a little you know and it's it's a smaller percentage it's it's not a big it's not a big group i don't think even in the writers guild and i don't know much that much about them i'm just playing the the averages i would say that you probably got you know more good writers than bad and you have to sort of carry that dead weight with you um because yeah. you know you have to protect them too yes I, I do agree but there's a part of me just looking at the state of uh pop culture and uh the media that we're with the word i hate the word consuming but i'm just not just use it we're consuming and there is a lot of that just seems i can't say seems but a lot of people will say oh severance is really good or the andor is really good and this show is really good and you can give these singular examples and then they say but it's on hbo or it's on apple tv or it's on netflix and, and you think okay so they've got these tentpole shows and yet the rest of it isn't getting mentioned and there's more there's more things that aren't getting mentioned because they're not very good or they're just really bad and part of me part of me wonders if the ai uh, maybe i haven't thought this through yet but i guess bad writers would use ai in a very bad way possibly or it will elevate them it, it, there's a whole quagmire here because i feel it like probably would bottom go line, bad writers give the writer's strike a bad name and the public won't be on their side because the public for many years have just been so annoyed with the gender politics or just anything to do with politics that's being inserted into their shows. And we, I just finished the podcast with Adam and we just talked about how the Mario will film just, it just tells a great story and there's no need to insert real life uh, gender issues into it. In fact, Nintendo actively discouraged it. They just wanted some escapism. And yet there are a lot of writers who don't, they want to use a property as their launch vehicle for their politics and a producer might you know let's say the studio i don't know i'm talking am i talking out my ass you tell me but if there's if they cut the well, writers then it's up to the it's producer. not just the writers well it's not just the writers um you know i mean you can you know i wasn't really thinking of that thinking of that when you were saying bad writers but to me it's always the producers and the studios that control all of that because they're going to tell the writers, you know, this is what we want in the story. And the writers may have yeah. some leeway to be able to do that, but that's always going to be controlled by the producers, probably the director, but there I've seen some re recent reports where they talk about how the directors, uh, especially in Marvel uh, may not actually direct the films as much as they're sort of there at, you know, they're on site, but they're the captain of the ship, so to speak. And they're just mm -hmm. kind of making everything run smoothly, but it's actually, you know, the studio that's deciding what's in uh, the movies and those sort of things. And that always, and, and to me, and, and I think they're the ones that are inserting political beliefs or however they want to do it. And I guess there's a place for it if people want to, you know, want to use art as a way, as a storytelling vehicle to bring about social change or justice. I mean, comic books were always like that. Comic books always brought things about interesting things at the time. Stan Lee did that all the time, you know, with, you think about the Incredible Hulk, that was, a, uh, you know, he, he, through gamma radiation, essentially, you know, feeding the nuclear, um, well, nuclear war and, and those sort of things, those fear and, you know, kind of discussing it and, you know, or bringing it about. So I think we've always kind of had that, but I, I think it's the studios, you know, where I'm on the side of the writers is, I think the writers get paid abysmal you know very very yeah, low yeah. and and of course when you know when they're in when the profit sharing's there and this is where i think that the studios are, are kind of missing it you know it just seems like they're so greedy when they have a hit show they want to make all the money and it would make more sense to me that you would have profit sharing with the writers and the crew because that would incentivize them to make the story the best that it could be so that if it's successful then everybody shares and everybody wins. And the in the store in the shows that aren't that successful, you know, probably aren't going to make as much money. But you know, if they're not given the production value and the money to make them, because that has a lot to do with it too, um, that can be a barrier as well. I get. And so AI, I think you know, getting back to AI, 
you know, of course the studios are going to want that. I mean, they're, you know, they would be able to, they might essentially be able to get rid of directors, you know, if they decide how this is how they want it. And, you know, they just have to have someone there that's, uh, you know, sort of the boss of the set or the set boss, you know, somebody that's just telling people what to do, but it's not really, because if you think about directors, think about like George Lucas or Spielberg, you know, they had stories to tell and, you know, they were telling the story through that lens, you know, and, and yeah, they had writers and those sort of people that were actually bringing it to life. But I think Lucas, especially in the beginning, he wrote the star, you know, he wrote Star Wars and then he brought it to life, you know, and so, you know, him being the director and the writer and essentially the big, you know, the biggest producer is what made it, I think, as good as it was. You know, Roddenberry, I think you could say the same things with Roddenberry. He had to make uh, concessions when he first brought out Star Trek with the studio, just so they would put it on the air. And then he finally got to do, you know, I think I remember an interview with him where, where the next generation was what he, that's really what he wanted. That was his vision. But I remember seeing him say that. I don't know if he really meant that or if he was just, per, you know, promoting the show and making it as good as it could be. But I think that, you know, those are things that can't be replaced by AI. Because you said in, the, in one of the earlier segments we were talking, and you're right, I think, if you have the passion for it is when it really makes it. Right. I think that's that's the yeah the key. My, and AI AI is not going to have that passion. I'm going on a. I agree with everything that you're saying, uh, but the I'm going on a different tangent where if you've got fewer staff and you're right, the producers also have like I say a political bias for or tendency for certain things. But I do wonder if you if you remove the writers, would the producers feel emboldened or less emboldened by the stories that they want to tell because they don't have the writers there to sort of say yes or no yeah or nay on with regards to feedback well that's interesting because i there's a there's a guy on twitter that i'm friendly with, with and i like him uh i guess you could say we're friends you know one of the few that i actually talked to maybe on you know direct messaging i don't, I don't do a lot of that but he actually wrote a film and it was picked up and it's on Netflix. Uh, and I had asked him uh, not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, I said, did you get to go to set? And he said, uh, no, he didn't. He didn't get a chance to go because of COVID. And so they didn't invite him. He said they usually do, but because of COVID, they didn't invite him. And I said, oh, and I said, I, I was just curious as to, you know, rewrites and those sort of things. And he said, yeah, he said just kind of depends on your contract. He said, a lot of the times they don't want us there because, you know, they think that writers think, you know, they view writers as prima donnas who think that their words are the ones that it should be no matter what. And they want to have the flexibility to change it. So to your point, yeah, I think that happens a lot, right? You know, they're not going to, because I've had people ask me, well, you know, if Bumper City or Cry in the Moon's Light, if somebody wanted to make it into a movie, would you, would you sell it to them or, you know, and well, you know, uh, the short answer is yes, you know, and of course, you know, it would depend on what they wanted to do with it. You know, it's my vision, those sort of things, but you know, if somebody wants to give me a six figure deal for seven books. Um, I'm probably going to say, okay, but if they're going to make all these changes and there are things that I don't necessarily like, then I'm probably not going to want to participate. You know, I'm going to say, okay, it's yours. You buy it outright from me and you can have it. So I think, you know, talking about, you know, on your point is, yeah, the studio, you know, the producers, you know, a lot of times they're going to want to have that freedom to take that particular piece of work and make it their own, you know, and do their own interpretation of it, not, you know, the source material, not necessarily follow it. I guess, I guess in a sense, then you could hold whoever produced it to uh, a better level of accountability because there is a lot of deflection when it comes to, so when it comes to criticism of, of the Hollywood system, because that you never, for example, I've been following uh, the, the whole Picard season three. Uh, I follow a couple of guys who make that TV show. Okay. And they do not, and I understand why, but they do not self-reflect in the way that fans do. So when fans bring, and there is obviously illegitimate criticism, but there's also a lot of legitimate criticism, but they are very good at deflecting any of the concerns that fans have. And they never sort of reflect on something that they've done. And I know it's their product. So you can't outright say on social media, you know what, 
we just episode seven just wasn't just wasn't there for us you know and paramount is trying to sell this to international networks i i get that and that and that's probably where a lot of the frustration comes with thinking that uh, a lot of writers are no good or they're not listening because they're not allowed to air their dirty laundry out on social media even the ones that are not even attached to the project yeah, directly probably. they just work in the industry and they've got to respect their fellow guild writers so to speak and it just creates it just creates in a sense like if, if no one's public with it then i mean I, I hate echo chambers and i feel like there is just one big echo chamber in in hollywood that promotes itself and allows not very good work to percolate to the top and then if you've got ai people are the viewers are like well this stuff isn't really good anyway so why not just give it to the ai and see what it does that's the attitude that a lot of people have on social media because they're so frustrated with certain productions and so when when i see strike when i see writers striking i'm like can you hide the bad can you hide the bad writers because they're not generating good publicity just bring out the good writers who are publicly striking and i'm on their side but i'm still like these bad writers aren't doing you any favors yeah, I, I just wonder though how much of it's bad writing and how much is it is produce is production and studios interference because you know one of the things that and, and I don't have a anything against Picard the show itself I, I did watch it but these guys are old you know and and I, and I don't mean I don't want to sound ageism because I'm an old guy too but it just seems like sometimes it's time to pass the torch and and to pick new subjects and. I think we try and hang on too long, you know, so this is where I'm going with this. So it just seems like Hollywood does this and they do this all the time. And I know why they, and I, I believe this is why they do it is because they want to hedge their bets on what they're going to make because they want to make money. And so they know that Star Trek and Picard is a big thing. And so that's a way to make money regardless profit of whether of nostalgia. it is. Yeah. It's profit of nostalgia. And so instead of producing brand new, writing brand new characters you know new stuff um that's one of the things that i always think about like you know indiana jones 5 uh, i don't have anything against indiana jones or harrison ford but i think to myself you know eventually things have to stop and i think that when they do then you have to find something new you have to find a new story and a new character and and hollywood seems like it always wants to go back it's like the marvel movies they're just not letting it go because it's it's a cash cow and they're they're bitching a little bit now about the newer versions of stuff because they don't think it's going to be as good or it's not as good or the public hasn't adapted to it and i think we've been hearing uh superhero fatigue or superhero movie fatigue for almost 10 years now right i mean it we, it started for a while yeah. and everybody's been bitching about it but people still love it but chris evans can't play captain america forever just because he's just a, he's he's a man he's going to get old and what i don't want to see is ai taking that over and it's always going to be the image of chris evans just a younger version but it's now cgi generated because it looks so good i'd rather see a happen. new i yeah, don't mean that it, i'm not i say it's got to happen not because i want it to happen but it's because it, the studio is so sort of nonchalant. yes yeah yes and, and so you're and it, yes i agree and i think that you know, I, I've seen some photographs of Harrison Ford, for example, AI generated where it made him look young. Yeah. And all I could yeah. think of was they're going to plug that into him. They're going to make an Indiana Jones 18 and it's going to be all CGI characters <laughs> um, that, you know, we're not going to be able to tell the difference. And I, I don't know that I'm in favor of that. You know, I, I, I would like, I like to see new stories and new takes on things and you know, the idea that there's nothing that's totally new it isn't true. You know, there's always something that's new. There's always something that somebody creates. But this is where this is where we can link in my, my point about having fewer writers. And as you say, you've got producers who are doing this. If you trim down, if you take out the writers and you just have one writer, say, and you're CGIing everything because everything can be done with an algorithm, that means you don't need costume artists, makeup artists, uh, stunt coordinators, the whole lot, and you just put it through this machine. Surely that means there's fewer and fewer people who are actually accountable for the production of that thing. And then they've just got to hold their hands up and say, yeah, that's on me. Whereas at the moment, no one says that. 
that you, you as you say well it could have been a you, i'm trying to blame the, the writers and you're saying quite rightfully well it could have been a producer you know it's just like well no one learns then do they because they can just offload the blame onto somebody else oh it was the schedule uh we had to film back to back because of covid it was this reason it was that reason or you're racist <laughs> Oh, yeah, you, you're right. right. I mean, that's right. Uh, you know, you hear people talk about, um, you know, how Star Wars uh, went astray and, you know, people want to blame the writers or they want to blame the director. Or, you know, I always fall back on the studio. I think it's just them, you know, but I, I don't know. I mean, I guess you could have AI that could do it, but it's just not going to be the same. I, I think the studios need and this is never going to happen because they're too greedy. You know, they're in it to make money. They're They're, they're going to trim. They're going to trim everybody they can because they want to make as much money as they can because, you know, the CEO of Disney wants to make his bonus, his multi-million dollar yeah. bonus. Yeah. For, that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about these people making multi-million dollar bonuses uh, for making a successful company. I don't believe, you know, and I don't believe for one minute that the CEO of Disney or anybody else gives a shit about politics. What they care about is the stakeholders yeah that's what they care about they care about the shareholders yes you know, i said stakeholders i meant shareholders that's what they okay. what they care about is the shareholders and making sure they're making tons of money and they have a huge profit so that they can make their bonuses and they're going to stay in that position as long as they're keeping all their shareholders happy and that's what they're after and if they and if that works if you know if politics enters into it and that helps them make money then that's what they're going to do but the minute they start losing money then then they'll change the game uh, right I, that's what yeah, i think i i i totally agree it's about money uh, it's yeah a lot of the politics is just um it's like it's like that it's like nice guys with women they pretend to be nice just to get something from the woman and so a lot of corporations just like are just like nice guys they'll they'll follow a particular political trend make money from it and then they'll then they'll switch you can see it with the with some of the controversies recently with Bud Light and stuff but my question to you is who is responsible because you've talked about Star Wars uh but you've I, I think you've been talking about the Star Wars four five and six but who ultimately was responsible for the prequels well Lucas and, right and, so it, now you can say one person was responsible for that because he wrote produced and directed so that's on him and that's partly yeah. what I'm hoping for as an outcome. If you do downsize everybody else because of AI, well, you know, well, and that that may or may not be a great example. I mean, I I think that for you know my thought on on Lucas Films and Star Wars is, and it could be nostalgia because you know when I was ten years old, my dad drug me to the theater to watch Star Wars, and I had no idea what it was, and I was thoroughly blown away by it. But you know, Lucas obviously wrote that and he wrote and he produced it and put it together but he didn't have the technology the cgi so he had to work within the framework of what he had and so to me his storytelling not just his writing storytelling but his cinematic storytelling was much better in the first one and then in empire and that's how, that's what i think and then i think when oh, i agree yeah then when he developed uh cgi and he also became you know, the legend that he is in Hollywood and everywhere else. And then he could go back and he sort of could create, I guess he could create what he really always wanted, which, you know, to me, I just wasn't a fan of the first three, the prequels. I didn't like them nearly as much as I did New Hope and Empire. But, you know, it's a different generation. I mean, people like, you know, people obviously like them. So, you know, you know how, I, I mean, you and I've talked before how I feel about reviews and being critical. I, I try not to because it's somebody else's vision and you know, if people like it, they like it. And I don't knock them for that. That's okay with me. You know, I mean, that's, you know, that, that has nothing to do with me. I mean, if you like it, you like it. And if you don't, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, once he was able to do that and then he sold it to Disney, you know, he, he turned it into what it is. And, you know, and some people are, I think are better at uh, the Star Wars, you know, influence than others. Like Favreau clearly understood uh or maybe not understood but i think he just produced a really cool thing with a mandalorian um you know i liked it and i didn't necessarily like the last couple uh seasons but um but at least in the beginning i just thought it was it was my favorite kenobi was good you know there was a lot of them were good um i just think it depends on who's directing who's producing 
who's got more of an influence on things, uh, you know, in that, you know, and you're not wrong. You, you want to find one person to blame necessarily, but I, I don't know that you can. I think the biggest problem that, that Hollywood has and studios have is not being willing or as willing to take a chance on a project because what they want are sure bets. Mm. So they, they're, they're reluctant because, you know, it's, I mean, it's human nature, right? If, if you were playing the stock market, you know, if I had, if I had not, not you, how about me? You know, if I go to play the stock market, and I don't have the money for it. I want to make sure that whatever whatever company I invest in is going to make a lot of money so that I don't lose money. That's just human nature. And, and films are, well, essentially that's the stock market for them. You know, they're, you know, they're putting their money and in investing in something and, you know, they got to have a return. They can't take, keep taking losses. So, but I just think that they're not as, you know, they're always going back to all the old stuff. Like, you know, you see them re making, uh, remaking old movies you know or older movies they're always remaking them because their belief is that that's going to make money because that's what people want but a lot of times the remakes are that they're, they're not that good you know so i just think that you know i'd like to see them be a little bit more creative with the writers and the producers and let them spread their wings a little bit and and not be in the way all the time that's how i see it anyway there was a there was a review for Star Trek 09, closer to the year 2009. And the person asked, why are they, why are they rebooting the, the TOS again? And their theory is, this is in 2009, and it's much more exaggerated now. But they said in 2009, you've got YouTube, you've got social media, you've got the beginning of Facebook and Twitter. You've got so many things that can distract us now that the Hollywood system or the, and the TV system as well, they have to produce things for the most part that are recognizable. That's why you're getting a regurgitation of pop culture from the 90s, 80s, 70s and 60s or the remakes from classic films, you know, you know the Steven Soderbergh, Soderbergh uh, Ocean's Eleven, which is actually a good remake, but it still has some kind of mind share. And that's what people are supposedly in the industry think is what's going to make them money because if you haven't got anything that's with a proper brand appeal, then you're just not going to get any traction. Yeah. And there's probably a lot of truth to that. I mean, you know, let's think about Marvel for a minute. Um, Cause I always had this discussion with a friend of mine about it, you know, and one of the things that I don't like about some of the Marvel films is that they strayed too far from the comics. You know, yes. I, I'm an old, I grew up with the comics, so I'm a fan of the comics, but on the other hand, you know, I saw an interview with John Favreau where he said somebody asked him about that sort of that same thing with Star Wars that you strayed away from some of that. And he said, look, it's a whole new fan base. You know, the people that grew up with New Hope are one set of fans, but we've got all these new ones that didn't grow up with that. So they don't have the same attachment to it. And so he's not wrong. You know, you, you got to appeal to both, yeah. you know, the newer ones and, and the older ones, too. But in the Marvel films, you know, they they strayed away, I think, from a lot. But they they made so much money, they, you know, they reached escape velocity. So it doesn't matter, you know. You know, my saying this doesn't affect the films one way or the other or the popularity of them. But, um, you know, I and I think that, you know, you already had that source material. So I think going, you know, for me, I would have liked to have seen more of that. But I think you're you're right about that. You know, you have to. You know, the studios, they want that sure bet. So they go back to those 80s, 90s things that were successful and say, we'll just remake them because this generation is going to like them too. And I don't know that that's necessarily the case. Yeah. I, you know, I, yeah. I mean, um, you know, I grew up watching Don, you know, watching uh, Don Johnson, you know, uh, Miami Vice, and they remade that and it was terrible. <laughs> it just uh, because there's some things they just shouldn't remake. But let, I guess that's what I was saying. They need to let it go and just start on some some new things, you know, uh, you know, get some new creatives going and uh, and do it that way. And I, I think AI is going to it's going to play a big role in all that kind of stuff, because like I said in that in the blog piece I wrote, I, I don't see them just using it for creative purposes and the things that we talked about, but I see them using it for. Uh, essentially intelligence reasons, you know, um, you know, what's the probability that this is going to make money? And if it does, how much is it actually going to generate? You know, I mean, I can definitely see studios using 
AI for that purpose, you know, hiring somebody that's skilled in intelligence gathering. And because I knew a student, uh, we have a university here, Mercyhurst University, near where I live, and they have an intelligence studies program. And I think when most people think about intelligence studies, their common thought is you're talking about government work and, you know, those sort of uh, uh, applications. But I knew a, a kid that he actually went to work for Monsanto and did intelligence studies for that group. Um, and I said, what on earth would you do for them? And what he did was he was, you know, they were looking for outcomes and probabilities and social media uprisings and different places they had interests in. So they would know whether to deploy or not deploy their products and services in those areas. And so I, if, if, if studios aren't using it now, I'd be kind of surprised. Cause I, I just think that they're, they're going to hire people that know how to do those kind of intelligence work and use AI for it and say, you know, Alan McGill's just, you know, he's got this story out there called a crime in the moon's light. Does anybody care about werewolves right now? You know, does anybody <laughs> care about witches? You know, is this going to sell or is this a small thing? You know, right, um, yeah. that sort of thing. And then they just, you know, they don't even bother. And if I submit something, they're just like, yeah, pass. Thanks a lot. But our AI said, you're probably not going to make any money. <laughs> so, you know, um, it could be that, you know, and I think that that's what they're going to use it for. Personally, I think that's how they're going to start. Because I, I would. If it was me, I would. I, yeah, you know, yeah. if I had a right, if I, if I owned my own little publishing house and I needed to make money and you sent me something that you wrote and you wanted to produce a book and you wanted me to pick you up, I would put AI on that and say, what's the, what's the probability that this make, actually makes any money and what should I offer them? And I think that's what you're, you're going to see a lot of that starting to happen. Hmm. If they well, do it at all. Yeah, well, it's uh, just talking with you has made me realize a little bit more about all the different permutations that the future holds for us with, with regards to creating. It's uh, I can understand why people are worried and also trying to poo-poo it and uh, demean it in some way. But as always, I sound cliched, but you can't hold back the tide of progress, whatever form that may be. So we'll just have, no, to, no, we'll no. Just have to revisit this topic at some point a year from now or something. Yeah. It's, about it's been that. a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, it's been it's good to talk to somebody who is sort of outside of my sphere of uh, like beyond Adam and my other friends here, and just get someone who's also interested, but from culturally from a different background, talking about it. So it's it's been interesting. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I, I uh, this is a topic I like. I said I wrote it as my third blog blog piece. I'll probably put it up next week, but. Um, AI just has a lot of interesting applications and I think about it a lot. I think mm -hmm. about it creatively, you know, I try not to think about Terminator and the matrix too much because, you know, then it just makes me depressed. So I wanted to mention that before, because I don't think we'll have that problem because we can just, someone said it, someone had this concern on one of those podcasts I listened to and they said, we can just turn it off because no, nah, I don't think that's how it's going to go. <laughs> I, well, I the way the way he go. explained it is we can just turn it off we just unplug it because it's not attached to anything physical but at the moment we can unplug it anyway well you can um, yeah but you can't <laughs> i mean you can turn off electricity but you'd have to turn off the whole world for at least a little bit but it's going to hide in yeah. in some yeah. sort of computer program i mean do you ever read the book safe colossus? no i haven't i think i sent you a link look up the book's colossus i can't think of the guy's okay. name wrote it but it's essentially about ai and it's about, and this was written years ago. Um, I think, I, I think maybe in the seventies or eighties and it's an old book and, and Colossus is an AI that uh, eventually gets to the point where humans wind up worshiping Colossus as a God because he provides everything for them and they don't really have to work or do anything and just kind of have to do what he says. And it, at one point in the book, Colossus says something to them, something to the effect of whoever whoever the scientist is that helped develop them or something it says something in effect, you will worship me as a God at one point. Mm -hmm. And so they want to shut him off, but Colossus is in, is actually housed in this mountain and he has solar panels and everything else to, so you can't shut him off. And so eventually they get to a point where I think they do shut him off. And then there's like a Martian invasion and it goes a little more sci-fi, but <laughs> I think if AI becomes as smart as we just talked about, then I think AI is going to make sure it hides somewhere. And even if the electricity is shut off, it'll be somewhere that it can be 
brought back. So don't, don't leave us on a negative note, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people, you know, people much smarter <laughs> than me, uh, like Elon Musk, need to figure out a way to you know to handle it if it gets out of hand. Because I don't know, I just I can see some problems and issues, but. You know, on the other hand, like you said, things are, you know, technology is good nor bad. You know, it is finding cures for diseases. Uh, you know, I read some articles about it digging into cells and, you know, at the micro levels and different things and finding uh, applications for that. So, you know, I guess we'll see, yeah, it found we'll a see new, when it becomes fully self-aware. It found a new antibiotic, I think, this week or last week. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. That's, I think um, it's the same article I read. So. I, will, I will say something one more thing before before we uh click off is that and i wanted to say this way at the beginning and this conversation has been like a confluence of various things there's no there's no rhyme or reason to it really i'll have to try and see if, if i can edit it to make it have some sort of semblance of order um <laughs> but i have pulled back from some of the news about ai because a couple of people on twitter every day they say this amazing thing has happened with AI this week. It's like, okay, the first few times, okay, this is great. Let me find out what it is. And then afterwards, those, those leaps don't, those leaps in sort of technological project progress don't deserve that labeling. Oh, this is awesome. This is, this is groundbreaking. This is, this is brand new. And I've had to just shut it off. And now, now that I'm more confident in knowing what I want from it, I'm looking for specific things and I'm just trying to tune out whatever like mid journey 5.1 came out All right i'm not interested i'll deal with it later right i've had to put some things in the back burner because there's just so much developing now and well, i just try to i'm trying to tune it out because there's a mess of well, information you know, and like you said i look at that as clickbait you know there, there's certain websites that i don't even, be, yeah I, I mean that's what it sounds like right that they're just putting something out there and then you click on it and you know, I, I have that with Screen Rants and CBR. I won't even open an article that they, because they have just baited me in too many times about <laughs> something, you know, some sort of clickbait about how Batman yeah. was the worst character ever and, you know, those sort of things. And I won't even click on any article. As soon as I see that they are the ones that produced it, I don't even click on it because yeah. it's just nonsense. It just baits you in and then it's, you know, it's, that's what it sounds like. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and yeah, I can see that too with AI. They do that all the time. This is the most amazing thing, or this is the bad thing that's going to happen, or you know, whatever it is. And I, I don't pay a lot of attention to that either. You know, I saw, I saw it could have been a screen out or a CBR thing, but last week they said Star Trek Stage New World season two will fix this one thing. There's one flaw about Kirk, and it's like, what flaw? <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, I saw it too. I know the one. You're right. I did it too, and I won't even oh, click on it because I'm. Yeah. I love. I just finished Strange New Worlds, and I loved it. And I thought, and I saw that, and I thought, oh uh, yeah, there, you know, there's always something, and it's always something stupid. And I don't know who writes these articles half the time, but and sometimes I think it's AI. Yeah, you know, sometimes I think it's yeah. just AI writing it to bait me into to wanting to read it, and then I think that's not no, that's not true. I mean, or or at least I don't share that opinion you know, about, about that particular piece. And so, cause like I said, I, I try not to be too critical about art in a general, you know, all art, because I just think that everybody has a different taste and, and there's always a different opinion and it's perfectly okay with me. I'm, you know, I, who am I to say something's bad or is not bad? You know, I can do have my own opinion, but you know, I don't want to influence somebody else because they might love it. Do you want to jump on uh, a sort of see a season two wrap up of strange new worlds with me and Adam, because because we're very critical, and I don't. I oh, you don't like it? <laughs> I, I love. It. I no, love. I actually new think. Worlds. I actually think Strange New Worlds is the best so far, but I don't, still don't think it's very good. But oh, I think see, it's the I, best I really, so far. I really enjoyed it, but but I, I have wondered... a, a sort of a unique ability to kind of lay back and let somebody entertain me and not 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 go too granular with it. Yeah, well, I'll jump on is, with you guys anytime. Really, the, the thing is, I don't know much about TOS, and I made this point with Adam that. The, the, the less I know about this particular part of the franchise, the more I could sit back and enjoy it. That's why I can't reckon yeah. with the later stuff. So I, that's one of the reasons why I like it. But then there are some other things that maybe we can talk about. But I'm wondering, because me and Adam are going to review it. We're going to do episode by episode. And then if you want, I'll ask him. Uh, we could do like a season wrap up and just get three different opinions. On yeah, it. sure. Yeah. 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 Because I, I mean, I grew up on uh, Kirk and Spock and, and right. you know, and I, 
you know, I never really gravitated to TNG until uh, First Contact. You know, when that movie came out, I, I thought it was probably, I actually thought it was probably the best of all the Star Trek films. And I and I really liked Wrath of Khan, and I really liked The Undiscovered Country, which, you know, most people don't like The Undiscovered Country. So I like it. But, but like it. yeah, I, I do like, uh, and I, I think that uh, Anson Mount, in fact, I was just thinking about this the other day when I was finished watching it. And there were some quirky episodes in it. And then I thought back and I thought, but the original series did that. They had quirky episodes, you know, that were just kind of weird, you know, I mean, you know, and so this, you know, Strange New Worlds did the same thing. And that would, if you think about it, that would kind of match the original series in a way. We'll have to talk about it in our yep. season two wrap up i guess uh, but the trailer looks interesting it looks like they're trying they're trying to fix the klingon so there's some fans maybe working for them and they're saying listen we should do this and that they're taking on the feedback anyway so i have i have higher hopes for season, season two than season one so i'm going into it into it optimistically just so i you. loved it so i'm sure i'll like whatever's coming out okay right then thanks All for right, your my time friend. yeah yeah thank you, you uh, take care of yourself uh, like i said it's a little strange talking to somebody that's early in the morning and I'm late at night. So that's, that's a little different for me, but I do appreciate uh, you having me on.